Let's talk. In that message, I shared the fact that society keeps telling us that we're to start a conversation. Society keeps telling us that we're to talk about things, that we're to start a conversation, but at the same time lists a number of topics that we're just not supposed to talk about, a number of topics that are just off limit. It seems kind of contradictory, but of course much of society and much of what is uh, held today is contradictory because it is outside of God's law, God's word, God's, God's grace. But we must be willing to discuss the important issues of the day. We must be willing to talk about it. Last Sunday I said we, we need to be ready to lead the conversation. Can somebody say amen this morning? Amen. See, the enemy wants... Uh, the enemy knows that whenever, uh, that, that when it, that the, sorry, the enemy wins when the truth is withheld. We'll get it out there yet. The enemy wins when the truth is withheld. Whenever the truth is held back, when it's not talked about, when it's not shared, when it's not openly available, the enemy wins in those situations uh, every single time. However, listen, for truth, for truth to prevail, we have to set aside our opinion. Now that's a tough thing for us as just human beings, as individuals, and particularly as Americans, as Westerners, because we take that word independence literally. <laughs> and we tend to see ourselves sometimes as individual units, as people unto ourselves, but that's not the way God created us. Can I get an amen or an oh me this morning? So we have to set aside opinion and then we have to speak truth we have to speak the truth of God's word. In other words, we're to lead the conversation, but we're to do it from a biblical world view. And I believe the Lord would have us to examine several important topics from a biblical perspective, specifically looking at that important topic, that relevant topic, and to do so from a biblical perspective. And so today, surprise, surprise, on this Independence Weekend, I feel compelled to talk about freedom. To talk about freedom. You see, there's only one true freedom. There's really only one true freedom. True freedom is linked directly to a relationship with God. There's no other way to have real and true freedom except that freedom is linked directly to a relationship with God. I asked you to turn to Psalm 119. If you would, look down until you find verse 41. Psalm 119 is actually the longest chapter in the entire Bible, so I'll give you a second to get to verse 41. But Psalm 119 and verse 41. And as we look there this morning, normally I would read from the New King James Version. This morning I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, but I want you to look at your text as well. Follow along with me as I read verse 41, Psalm 119. Lord, give me your unfailing love, the salvation that you promised me. Then I can answer those who taunt me. Why? For I trust in your word. Do not snatch your word of truth from me, for your regulations are my, listen to that, only hope. I will keep on obeying your instructions forever and ever. I will walk in freedom. Some translations say liberty. I will walk in freedom, for I have devoted myself to your commandments. 46, I will speak to kings about your laws not their laws. I will speak to kings. I will speak to rulers. I will speak to governmental authorities about your laws and I will not be ashamed. Precious Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy presence today and thank you for your word of truth. Your word and your spirit coupled together through the saving grace brought to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Give us true liberty. Give us freedom. Help us to rejoice and celebrate that freedom and help us even more so to live in the fullness of that liberty and freedom, Lord God, and lead others into it as well and we give you praise in Jesus' name. And the saints of God said, Amen. out of God's unfailing love, he has given us his truth. 
That's one of the great and blessed gifts, the precious gifts that God has given to us. Out of his unfailing love for us, he has given us his truth. See, the truth uh, discovered in God's word is the foundation for all truth. You know, truth doesn't vary. It's not, well, it's this truth for that person and it's another truth for this person over here. That's what relativism teaches today. That each person has to discover their own truth for themselves. And truth is only, uh, only relates to, there's no, no genuine truth, there's no standard of truth. Truth is related to the subject or the topic or the particular situation that you're in. I had a conversation a number of years ago as I was checking out at my favorite grocery store. I love to have conversation, particularly with the young cashiers and, and stock individuals there. You notice I didn't say stock boys. I'm getting too politically correct, I think. So I'm talking to them and I start talking with them about truth. And they said, well, there's no real truth. It's all connected to the situation you're in. And so I said to them, I said, you really believe? Oh, yes. I said, so then if you put your wallet here on this conveyor belt and I picked it up and I said, well, I need the money out of it. So my truth is that I need the money and the wallet was there available to me. So there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with me taking the money out of that wallet to pay for my groceries because my reality, my truth is that I need it. It was made available to me that you'd be okay with that. And I got a blank stare. <laughs> truth is truth, amen? There's only one truth, and that truth is the same for everyone. There's no truth for believers and truth for unbelievers. The truth is the truth. Even scientists, when they're doing their scientific experience, experiments, have to have a baseline. If they're going to use a piece of scientific equipment, they have to calibrate that piece of equipment to what they know is the truth so that they can perform the test and see what the variance and the difference is. There's got to be a baseline in everything. There's got to be a standard. There's got to be a truth that we know is absolute truth. And the word of God is the baseline of truth. Can somebody say amen? amen. Jesus declared in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, if you abide in my what? Say it again, if you abide in my what? Word. If you abide in my what? Word. And you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, amen? It's the truth that makes us free. Real freedom comes through living by the truth. Back to Psalm 119, verse 45. And I pray you keep that text open because I'm going to refer back to it. Verse 45, I will walk in freedom for I have devoted myself to your commandments. See, our founding fathers made the connection between the word of God and freedom. There was no separation there. Our founding fathers knew that true freedom, real freedom, the only type of freedom that you could really have came as a relationship and through the word of God. On March 23rd, 1775, Patrick Henry stood to address the Second Virginia Convention. You see, the British had been amassing troops in the colonies bringing their naval fleets over. The colonies had continued to give requests to the king that the king would hear their petition for, uh, for representation and fairness of trade. And as Patrick Henry stood there to address that second Virginia convention, he began speaking out with a very eloquent and very bold and passionate declaration and address. As the members there were waiting for the king to respond to the last appeal, Patrick Henry stood there and gave this wonderful and powerful and passionate uh, treaty on freedom. And at the end of his declaration, he gave this famous statement. He said, Almighty God, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. 
Most all of us from our history have heard that phrase over and over again, give me liberty or give me death. Not many of us have heard that he said almighty God and in his impassioned statement related back to his relationship to God many, many times over. Patrick Henry was one of our founding fathers. He was a ratifier of the Constitution and he saw a direct connection between God's word and the freedom of our nation. He said this, righteousness alone. Did you hear that this morning? Righteousness alone can exalt America as a nation. Whoever thou art, remember this, and in thy sphere practice virtue thyself and encourage it in others. John Adams, signer of the Declaration of Independence, one of two signers of the Bill of Rights, second president of the United States, declared concerning God's word and freedom, he said this, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I believed then and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. Wow. What about our documentation? The Declaration of Independence makes the connection between the Word of God and freedom. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What does that mean? Anybody ought to be able to figure this out. Can I get an amen? amen. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Created equal not evolved at the same time. And they are endowed with their what? Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are, listen, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The preamble to our Constitution. Listen, we, the people. What did the Declaration of Independence just tell us? It told us that the government was to be instituted by the people, and the people are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and listen, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Folks, I tell you this morning, the preamble to the constitution declares that we, the people, are responsible to secure the blessings of liberty. Amen? We, the people, are, are challenged. We're charged with securing the blessings of liberty. But the founding fathers based our ability to secure liberty on a reliance to the word of God. They're not separated. They cannot be separated. There's only one truth, and that truth and reality comes from the baseline of the word of God. The First Amendment to our Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Do you know that the First Amendment was enacted to make sure that our faith could be freely followed in every aspect of life, including the government, not to restrict faith from government? We know exactly what our founding fathers were talking about. We know exactly what they were saying. And I step out to tell you that they were not talking. Although it's been translated this way and although Pastor Hensel is going to tell you we need to love everybody, even those that are in darkness. Can somebody say amen this morning? But our founding fathers did not establish the Constitution of the United States of America and the First Amendment so that every religion of the world would 
would have opportunity to be practiced freely. They were speaking specifically about the Christian faith. I'm not being closed-minded. That's the reality of the truth. You can try to reinterpret it any way that a person would want to try to reinterpret it, but that's the truth of our founding fathers. That's their heart. They know and understand that truth comes from the Word of God. Liberty and freedom comes from following the Word of God, and there is only one creator. Amen? Amen. Our nation is founded on the principle that freedom exists where God's Word is the standard of truth. That's why our nation is being torn apart today. Because there's opposing philosophies that are trying to usurp the authority of the Word of God. Many of us as believers have incorporated into our own faith perspective other things beside the truth of the Word of God. And so when an issue comes up, I hear individuals all the time discussing what their opinion is about that issue, and it's not based on the Word of God. It's based on a thought. It's based on something that they've seen and something that they've heard and a feeling that they've had about a particular individual or a situation. Do you hear, Pastor? And so I'm talking in love this morning because God wants all all of us to have true liberty and true freedom. He is not oppressive. He's not trying to hold people down. He's not trying to hold people back, but he's the creator of this whole ball, this big blue marble that we live in. God who created is also the one who knows exactly the way to live the best life according to his precepts. We can't distort love. We can't say that love is something that God did not define it to be. True love comes directly from the throne of God. And when that true love flows out from the throne of God by his Holy Spirit into the hearts and lives of his children, that true pure love also has the opportunity to flow out through that child of God into the hearts and lives of others. We want to make sure that we don't distort it as it goes through. Can somebody say amen? God is so good. See, we must be ready to stand for truth. In this current day and age, we must be ready to stand for truth. See, when we stand for true freedom, we'll find ourselves in opposition to false liberty. Listen to what 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 17, has to say about false liberty. Reading once again from the New Living Translation, it says, these people are as useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting, with an appeal to twisted sexual desires. They lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom. But they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. That's the reality. And a God of love doesn't want to see anybody suffer in that way. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. God loves you and I so much. How do we know how much he loves us? Because Jesus went all the way to Calvary for you and I. Amen. But I've got to tell you this morning, not just for you and I. He went all the way to Calvary so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. There are those today who believe that they have freedom to do whatever they want. They interpret freedom as this mindset that freedom means that I have the freedom to choose to do anything that I want. My freedom should be that I can just determine my own life and lifestyle and live life any of the way that I want to do that. But that is false freedom. That mindset brings people under bondage. Standing for true freedom brings us into opposition to those who are in the bondage of sin. But we have to stand for freedom anyway. You know, I could have got up here on Independence Day weekend and I could have preached a nice flowery message about we're Americans, so we're blessed. Being an American doesn't necessarily mean you're blessed. 
Just like walking into a garage doesn't mean you're a car. And sitting in McDonald's doesn't mean you're a hamburger. Praise God. And just claiming to be a Christian doesn't mean you're blessed. Come on now, let's be real. Setting down in a church on Sunday morning doesn't mean you're a Christian. Jesus said, if you abide in my word and are my disciples, what? Indeed. Now, that's not, that's not for me to judge. That, that is a personal walk in relationship, but there is a reality of what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there means that there will be some fruit being produced in our life. Can I get an amen? Amen. And that means that that humility that God has for us will continue to grow, even though there might be a little bit of arrogance left there from our human nature, oh me, God will continue to transform us so that we will be humble. But you know, humble isn't passive. Come on now. Humility, Jesus changed the world in 33 years because he was humble and full of love, but he was anything but passive. Can somebody say amen? Amen. He stood for truth. And when we stand for truth, it's going to put us in opposition to those who want to believe in a false humility, but we must stand for truth anyway. See, we're not standing against people. We're standing for God. Remember that. We're not standing against people. We're standing for God. When we stand for the truth and somebody's in opposition, we have to be careful not to see that individual as an enemy, but see them as they truly are, an individual that doesn't have liberty that God would desire for them in bondage, and they need to be set free, and we've got to live, love them from the place of bondage to the place of liberty and freedom, amen? We're not standing against people. We're standing for God. We can't be ashamed to stand for what we know is right. Psalm 119 and verse 46. I will speak to kings about your laws and I will not be ashamed. I'll speak to kings about your laws and I will not be ashamed. I've got a good report for you this morning. This past week, I called our superintendent of schools, Dr. Laura Romano. I told her I was just doing a follow-up call to make sure that she had gotten the petition that the ministerial association sent to her to let her know that we were standing behind her as she refused to implement the uh, Department of Justice directive that we had to have transgender students to choose uh, whatever restroom they wanted to go to. Dr. Romano assured me that her and the school board had no intentions of implementing that policy. Amen. Amen. You know that we sent petitions to the governor's office, and I'm working to do a follow-up on that because petitions, I believe, went from all over the state of Florida that you helped institute and we helped institute to the governor's office, and so I'm going to do a follow-up on that, and when I get information, I'll bring it back to you. Amen? We, we've got to, we can't be afraid to stand for truth. We can't, we can't stand for our opinion because my opinion doesn't last. God, I'll just let you know my opinion lasts about as long as it stays up here in my mind. And then I speak it out of my mouth and Sister Fran hears it and she says, well, that ain't right. Boy, that just kills that, doesn't it? So we got to stand for truth. When we stand for truth, yes, people can stand in opposition, but the truth stands on its own merit. We don't have to defend the truth. The truth is the truth. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We, the people of God, must stand for God's word. We must stand on God's word and stand for God's word in how we conduct our lives. Now, I know none of us is perfect. Please don't hear that this morning that Pastor Hensel says you have to be perfect. There was only one who was perfect, and they crucified him. But we have to be coming more and more like Jesus Christ. We have to stand for truth, and we have to do it in the way we conduct our lives. As the Holy Spirit enables, we need to stay in the word of God and stay in prayer. And whenever we start straying from the truth, we need to get back to the Holy Spirit. We prayed for healing this morning. We need the Holy Spirit to heal our minds and heal our hearts and heal our spirits so that the enemy cannot use any toehold against us so that we're able to stand in the conduct of our life for God. We need to stand for truth in our conversations with others. 
Stand for truth in our conversations with others. We need to stand for truth in what we expect out of our leaders. Can somebody say amen to that this morning? We need to stand for truth in what we expect out of our leaders, and that translates in the way we, the people, vote. Can I get an amen this morning? Praise God. There's a whole lot more that I can say about that, and maybe the Lord will let me say it in another time. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen? The Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. When God is in our lives, we are set free. Now, I know probably nobody here has ever experienced what pastor is about to say, but just in case you might be able to relate, let me just share this with you. Maybe possibly at some point in life you've been down and discouraged. Now, I know probably you've never, yeah, right. Maybe you've, maybe, just maybe, you've been down and discouraged in your life. Maybe things hadn't been going your way. Maybe nobody understood you. Nobody was listening, and it seemed like nobody cared. And then all of a sudden, you realized that you had one who cared deeply for you, and you began talking to your Heavenly Father. And you began worshiping the God that you serve. And you began asking God through His Holy Spirit and His Word to minister to your heart in the midst of that discouragement. And even though you're situation didn't immediately change your spirit began to be lifted up why because where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty we could be in a jail cell but still be free in Jesus can somebody say amen when God is in our nation we are truly free when God is, don't buy into this that we got to keep religion in the church house and politics are something separate and different. It does not work that way, folks. If we want God to bless America, then we've got to get God into every aspect of America and into our politics. I'm not saying you have to hire a preacher or vote, uh, elect a preacher as the president, but it might not be a bad idea. Whew, I'm about to get in trouble. Folks, we can't agree with things that are not scriptural and ignore it whenever our elected officials support those things. Doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they represent. Doesn't matter how you personally feel about them. If they're not representing the word of God, then we cannot stand for them and we cannot stand for their policies. Now, here, pastor, this morning, the scripture says we are to honor those that are in authority. That doesn't change. Bad-mouthing our leaders does not do anything but depress us and others. Come on now. But when we pray the prayer of faith, God intervenes. And when we step out in faith and respond in faith to what we know truly is faith in the word of God, and when, whenever we, when we write our representatives, we need to write them, can somebody say amen, when we call and contact our representatives, and when we stop into that, step into that polling booth and we vote not according to our opinion, but according to the word of God, then God will place in the nation leaders that can rule with godly wisdom. We serve a good, good God. We serve a good, good God. Freedom is not the ability for everyone to live the way they choose. Freedom is the ability to live in harmony with God. That's not just for the Christian. There's not one truth for one and another truth for another. Don't let the world tell you you're being closed-minded. The truth is the truth. Will you stand with God? and for the freedom he offers. We stand with God and for the freedom he offers. Will you stand for truth? Will you live the truth? Will you stand in bold humility before God and others? Will you stand in love? What I'm asking is, will you help claim our nation back again? And in our sphere of influence, Let's speak the truth. Let's live the truth. Amen. I want to pray for you today. 
As we get ready to walk out of this, our Father's house, we're going to go out to a very real world. Now, I'm not making a distinction that this is not real and that is. I'm making the distinction that the world needs the light that's in you shining brighter than ever before. And sometimes the enemy would cause us to think, well, what can I do? But the scripture says two can put a thousand to flight. Amen? Actually, I think it says one can put a thousand to flight and two ten thousand. Man, I don't want to shortchange the word of God. But we need the Holy Spirit help to do it. And we need our brothers and sisters in Christ's help to do it as well. So let me pray for you this morning. Father God, as we stand in your presence, we do so, Lord God. Our hearts are full. Lord God, you have blessed us. Oh, there's challenges, yes. Life is difficult, yes. Father God, but you have blessed us because you have promised that if we seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, that all these things shall be added unto us. We have a hope. We have a joy, Lord God. We have a future, Father God, that we know that's assured to us. And as we stand before you this morning, Lord, I ask your blessing on my brothers and sisters in Christ, dear Lord God, who are doing their death level best to live for you in this world dear Lord God but today we stand dear Lord God even stronger today we stand with a defiance father against the darkness dear Lord God but a desire in our hearts for your love to flow through us into the lives of others dear Lord God for that truth that we will not back down we will not shut up we will not be quiet but father God we will stand and declare the truth not our opinion but from a biblical world view father god bless my brothers and sisters today lord as we prayed for healing we know that you touched we know that you healed we pray that you continue to perfect that healing in each and every one whether it be physical or emotional or spiritual father god we pray your strength dear lord god we pray your provision and your blessing father god but we also pray dear lord god that you set a fire in our souls that will not be quenched dear lord god until we hear the trumpet sound and you call our names dear lord god in these last days we're going to stand for you dear Lord God and we're going to ask Father God that you will not turn your back on the United States of America but as a remnant we pray in faith dear Lord God that you would heal our land and Father we thank you for your goodness and for your great care for it's in Jesus name we believe and pray in Jesus name Amen Amen. Before you head out this morning, two things. One is, I want to encourage everybody, come on down to the picnic. They're already down there barbecuing chicken, and they've got a piece of chicken with your name on it. Come on down to the picnic. Don't slide off and do something else. The second thing is, before you go, as Pastor Chris leads us in this worship song to close, I want you to think about somebody today, somebody that's right here in this place, and as you go out, I want you to shake their hand or hug their neck and tell them something good. Bless them in some way. Encourage them in some way. Let the joy that you have be poured out in the life of somebody else before you leave. Pastor Chris.